We've made it to Isaiah chapter 7. In Isaiah chapter 7, you got the prophecy to Ahaz. And something that will really help you while you're reading in 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and then in the prophets like Isaiah, is even though Isaiah comes comes about later on in your Bible, in terms of where it's placed in your Bible, Isaiah has taken place during the times, uh, he's prophesying during the times of these kings, like King Uzziah, King Ahaz. So you you look up Ahaz, and you find he's back there in Second Chronicles 28, and he's back there in Second Kings 16. So even though Isaiah is comes later in the part of your Bible when you're reading your Old Testament, like you're reading through it, it actually takes, his prophecies are actually taking place while those kings are reigning. And this time, last time he was talking about Uzziah, now he's talking about Ahaz. So let's find out some stuff about Ahaz really quick. Uh, look at Second Chronicles 28. And in Second Chronicles 28, you're going to find out that Isaiah or Ahaz is actually a really bad king. It says in Second Chronicles 28 and verse 1, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burnt his children in the fire. So child sacrifice. He's making images for false gods. He's burning his children to sacrifices to false gods. And it says he's doing this after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. It says he sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. And those high places, you know, that was a struggle for them. All throughout the Old Testament back there. And back to Isaiah 7. And let's look at what this prophecy to Ahaz is. So we know Ahaz, not a good guy. Really bad guy. Really bad king. And look what happens to him. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. So what's, what's something that happens because of Ahaz and his sin is he's got enemies rising up against him enemies teaming up getting confederate against him and that's exactly what you saw with solomon back there he was doing great but then when he got away from the lord his sinful lifestyle brought enemies and it says uh, back there in first kings eleven fourteen that the lord raised up an adversary against solomon you see, the more you go around just sinning, 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 not even trying to do better, you may end up having an adversary rise up against you. Somebody at work, somebody in your family, maybe even your own spouse just rising up against you. And the Lord will use that person to make you miserable and judge you so that you turn back to him. And that's what's happening with Ahaz here. He's way out of line the lord's trying to knock him back in line and so what happens is resin a really evil king king of syria and pekka the son of remaliah king of israel now remember you've got ahaz as the king of judah and i mean they're israel but that's the king the southern kingdom and then you've got pekka the king of Israel, and that's the northern kingdom. Remember, if you uh, listen to the studies about the kings that we, I've, 
I've done the past few years, you'll know that there's a divided kingdom. You got the northern kingdom, which is 10 tribes, 10 of the 12 tribes, and then you got the southern kingdom, which is Judah and Benjamin. And the northern kingdom is referred to as the kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim, as it's going to be referred to here. And then you got the southern kingdom referred to as the kingdom of Judah. So you got to remember that or you'll get confused. But he's got, the Lord's allowing these adversaries to rise up against Ahaz as a judgment. And it says they went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And that's because you can only prevail if God allows you to prevail. If God doesn't want you dead, you can't die. Uh, if God's not ready for you to die, you're not going to die. If, if God really doesn't want you to lose, you're not going to lose. Now, we've got a choice. We have a free will. God doesn't just determine everything that's going to happen. But if, if God's really not done with you, then he's really not done with you. And you're, you're not going to die. And they, got, they could not prevail against them. But it says in verse 2, And it was told the house of David, which is Judah, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. So it was told the house of David. And remember, just like the different, you know, things have different names, like king of Israel, sometimes called or the kingdom of Israel is sometimes called Ephraim. The kingdom of Judah is sometimes called house of David. So the house of David referring to Judah. And it was told the house of David saying Syria is confederate with Ephraim. Ephraim is the kingdom of Israel. And their king is Pekah at this time. So they're confederate with them. That means they're joined together with them. And, it, and when, you know, the house of David, when Ahaz and the people hear this, it says their heart is moved and the heart of the people's moved as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. So they're afraid. And so Ahaz, his sin leads to enemies being brought up against him, but also leads to fear of men. Your sin will always lead to the fear of men. Getting in trouble with men. Getting afraid people's going to find out about your sin even. It always leads to fear. In Proverbs 29, 25, it talks about how the fear of man bringeth a snare. And the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 28, You know, don't fear them which kill the body, but after that have nothing they can do, but rather fear him who's able to cast both soul and body in hell. So he, they're afraid. And their heart is moved like trees out there in the woods are moved when the wind blows. And who controls the wind? The Lord Jesus Christ. Just like he prepared a great wind over there in Jonah 1-4. Just like back there in Exodus when he had a strong east wind come and part the Red Sea. You know, if God wants to get you afraid, he can get you afraid. He controls the wind. You ever been out in a storm and the wind was so bad that it kind of startled you a little bit? Are you ever seen the, those uh, videos of a, a tornado and just how intimidating and scary the wind is? See, it doesn't take much for God to scare us. If he wanted to, he could just blow us away. And it says the heart of this people is moved as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. And men are like trees. It's like that guy in Mark 8, 24. He said, I see men as trees walking. Over and over, you see men are compared to trees. And Ahaz had been hanging around trees. As we read just a few minutes ago, back there in 2 Chronicles 28, 4, he had been sacrificing under every green tree. And they, uh, you know, just like Israel, they turned out to be just like their idols. Couldn't see, hear, or walk. Remember we talked about that a couple of studies ago. 
And it says in verse 3, Isaiah 7, 3, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. So Isaiah, the prophet, is going to go meet the king. And it says, he wants him to take somebody with him. He says, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shir Jashub, Shir Jashub thy son. So his son's name is Shir Jashub, which means a remnant shall return. So just the, the fact that he's bringing Shir Jashub is a prophecy itself because his name is a remnant shall return. It says, Thou and Shir Jashub at the end of the conduit of the upper pool and the highway of the fuller's field. So the king could meet Isaiah at the conduit. And that's, if they went there at the conduit, that's where others could also hear what Isaiah had to say. The conduit was, a, was like a way to gather water and bring it into the city. And the fuller's field is a place where they would bring clothes and they could be they be bleached. And supposedly there's a certain type of clay or soil there that would help soak out the, the natural oil and fats of the skin. And that's why you read over in like Malachi 3.2. And it talks about fuller's soap. So here it talks about a fuller's field where they would wash stuff. So in Malachi 3.2 it talks about fuller's soap. Or like in uh, Mark 9, 3, it talks about a fuller. And it says, And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. So the fuller's field, a place where a fuller would wash things. So he's going to meet him down there at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field, and say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. For the tale of these two smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria, and of the son of Remaliah. The son of Remaliah would be Pekah, king of Israel, as you saw back there in Isaiah 7, 1. And the Lord's just saying, don't be afraid of these tales of these smoking firebrands. If they're tales of smoking firebrands, then they're, they're like tales of wood pokers that are burned up, and now they're just blowing smoke. They're just hot air. They're just a bunch of hot air. They're just blowing smoke at you. They don't even be afraid of them. God can put their fire out. And if God says fear not, then fear not. If God says it's all right, it's all right. Don't be faint-hearted, Ahaz. These are just two kings that they got fierce anger, but they're just a bunch of hot air. And in verse 5, he says, Because Syria, Ephraim, now I remember Ephraim is another name also referring to the kingdom of Israel. So because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee. See, they've been plotting it up, making plans to come get rid of Ahaz, get him off the throne, take over the kingdom of Judah, most likely try to reunite it with the kingdom of Israel, make it one kingdom again. And then their their plan is to get Ahaz off the throne and put another king on the throne. And it says, let us go up against Judah and vex it. This is their plans. They're gonna, they want to go up against Judah and vex it. And let us make a breach therein for us. And set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabael. So they want to replace Ahaz with this son of Tabael. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. That's the Lord saying that. There's no need to be afraid. 
because it's not going to happen. So not even worry about it. They're just blowing smoke, blowing hot air. And he says, fear not. See, a lot of this stuff that everybody's talking about today, uh, when you talk, sit down and talk to people, or people see you reading the Bible and they start talking to you, they're not talking to you about the Bible. They're talking to you about things that they're so afraid of, things that they see on the news, things that they see on TikTok, things that they see on Facebook, on YouTube clips, and things like that that are on the news that's got them so afraid about things that most likely aren't even going to happen. And if they do happen, there's nothing they can do about it. Everybody's just going around in fear about something that's most likely not even going to happen and that they can't do anything about. The best thing to do would just be get in the Bible, trust God you're, that you're going to be okay, and if your flesh is not okay... Oh, well, you'll be in heaven. And if you're okay, God's still God. If your flesh is not okay, God's still God. Just like the, the, the three Hebrew boys back there in, in Daniel. You know, they believed that God was going to deliver them in the fiery furnace. But they said, you know, but if not, you know, they were still for God. They were still going to believe God was God and God was supreme in who he said he was. And that's the way you got to be about it. You see all this supposedly scary stuff going on? Probably made out to be a lot worse than it actually is. There's no sense in walking in fear about it. Just take it by faith that God's going to take care of you or, and preserve you. But if not, oh well. He, God's still God either way, and you're going to be okay either way. If you get to live... And you don't die, okay. If you do die, well, you're saved. You'll be with the Lord. So either way, you're good. So there's no need in going around just faint-hearted and in fear over these smoking firebrands in your life. And that's all that you're seeing when you scroll through TikTok. When you get into the conspiracy world of these YouTube shorts or Facebook shorts or reels or whatever they're called and you're just scrolling through these smoking firebrands these things that's blowing smoke a bunch of hot air most of it never even happens never does happen and you you've already spent years worried about something that was supposed to happen and it ends up not even happening so you're better off to just get in the scriptures soak yourself in the scriptures let that be what your mind is on because the scriptures are always up to date. They're always current. And if, trust me, if something is really, really bad that's going to affect you, somebody will come up to you face to face and tell you. You're not just going to find out about it on TikTok or a Facebook. Somebody's going to come up to you and tell you about it if it's really going to affect you directly. So you're not getting out of the loop if you don't get involved in all that the best thing to do is just soak yourself in the scriptures so it says thus saith the lord god it shall not stand neither shall it come to pass it's not going to happen ahaz so don't even worry about it don't worry about unnecessary fear he says for the head of syria is damascus and the head of damascus is resin you see, resin, just a man. Their head is a man. I made man. God made man, you see. That's what he's trying to say. I made man. Don't be afraid of him. He says, and within three score and five years, so three score, a score is 20, three scores is 60. So in three score and five, that's 65 years, shall Ephraim, remember Ephraim referring to the to the uh, 10 northern tribes, the northern kingdom the kingdom of israel he which pekka at this time is king he's saying in 65 years they're going to be broken that it be not a people and because see uh assyria comes through later and takes them out takes them into captivity and then foreigners come in there 
and they uh, they intermarry with so many of them that it messes them all up, and that's where you get the Samaritans from. You see, in 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 sixty five years, he said they're going to be broken so much that they even be not a people anymore. And see, that's the way you can view a lot of people or enemies that come in your life. Like with me at work, the turnover rate is so bad, you get a jerk or a smart aleck in there. There's no really no need to sweat it because two weeks he's going to be gone. Or you get somebody like a just a, a guy off the street and he comes in and in a week he's already telling you what to do and bossing you around. Just look over it because people like that, they're just smoking firebrands. They're just a bunch of hot air. They're blowing smoke. All the, the people like that, they just self-destruct. And they go around telling the wrong people what to do, bossing the wrong people around. I mean, they could do that to me all they want. I'm just a little I'm just a little guy there. But they go around doing that to the big bosses and people that's been there for 30 and 40 years uh, they're going to be gone in a couple weeks and they always end up quitting or getting fired or something most people like that that come in your life don't even worry about it because they're going to self-destruct just like these people they self-destruct so he says within three score and five years Ephraim's going to be broken that it be not a people and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. You see, once again, knowing that Ephraim is referring to the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, which is the ten northern tribes, it'll help you so much you're going to get confused. So, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. We know Remaliah's son is Pekah. From back there in verse 1, the king of Israel. And look what the Lord says here. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. I guess that's the key verse. So they just need to believe. All he has need to do is believe. But you see, uh, Judah ends up with the same fate on down the road. Because they get into the sins of the kings of Israel themselves. And then it says in verse 10, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz. That's a comforting thing. God will speak again and again and again to a wicked king like Ahaz. That comforts me. You know, I'm a saved, born-again believer. He's never going to stop speaking to me. And that comforts me that, you know, you think about lost people in your life. He can speak to them again and again and again, just like he did to Ahaz. Why? You'd think, well, Ahaz is so bad, he's only going to speak to him once, maybe none. But no, he speaks to him again and again. And he even says, hey, Ahaz, ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it in either in the depth or in the height above, saying, you know, anything in the depth all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and the height away and the height above, all the way up above the clouds. Whatever it is, I'll do it. Just ask me a sign and I will do it. And you know the Jews require a sign, first Corinthians one twenty two. They started with signs back there in Exodus four. And you know, it's Jesus said, you know, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but here the Lord's given you the permission to ask for one. You think if the Lord gave you permission to ask for a sign, you would ask for a sign. I mean, Gideon asked for a sign back there in Judges 6 with the wool or the fleece and, you know, and, and the dew. And it worked out for him. So Ahaz, he could ask for a sign and it could work out for him. But look what he says. He's too good to ask for a sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. But see, this is just fake spirituality saying, you know, I don't want to tempt the Lord. That's fake spirituality here. And we know it is because Ahaz is not a spiritual guy. He's not a good guy. I mean, he's a, 
child sacrificer and everything else. And he, it says in verse 13, Then he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But we, will ye weary my God also? So Isaiah says, Hear ye now, O house of David, which is the kingdom of Judah. It is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? See, he wearied God when he wouldn't ask for a sign. It tempted the Lord when he wouldn't do what he said. Ahaz actually tempts the Lord by acting so fake spiritually here. So he says, will you weary? It's a small thing to weary men, but are you going to weary my God as well? And you can weary God in the sense that, not in the sense that you can make him tired. Obviously, you can't, he's God. You can't make him tired. You can't, you know, make him feel any physical weakness. But like in Malachi 2.17, it said, You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, Wherein have we wearied him? When you say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? Stuff like that wearies God when you say stupid junk like that or when you say stupid junk like what Ahaz is saying right here. This pious junk. Fake spiritually, fake spiritual junk. Neither will I tempt the Lord, he said. He doesn't care about tempting the Lord. He's killed his own children in the sacrifice to a false God. He doesn't care about the Lord. Watch out for these people who live like the devil and will change the word of God without batting an eye. And then they say this fake spiritual stuff. Uh, that ought to make you sick. Because it makes God sick. But the Lord gives him a sign anyway. In verse 14. It says therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. But actually. This sign comes. Way after Ahaz. It says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the virgin birth, the prophecy of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The new modern versions of the Bible will change this to a young woman shall conceive. How is a young woman conceiving a son? Uh, I don't know. That is not a sign to me. But a virgin conceiving, a virgin having a child, that's a son. And you shall, uh, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And you know by Matthew one twenty three, Emmanuel means God with us. It's the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ being virgin born. And some people try to say that this is talking about Hezekiah or some, some other person. But uh, Hezekiah is already born when this is written. So it can't be a prophecy about him. And and then you go to the next verse. The next couple of verses seem to switch, and it's talking about Ahaz's, or it's talking about Isaiah's son. It says, "Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know how to refuse the evil and choose the good." So, butter and honey, showing you what he's come. He's part of a humble family. He's eating butter and honey, but you think further than that. Butter comes from what? Butter comes from milk. And what is milk picture? First Peter 2.2. 2. It's the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Milk pictures the word of God. And you get uh, butter. To make butter re requires milk and it requires work. So you think about that. Get the sincere milk of the word. And you work at it. And it says, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. You get the sincere milk of the word and you work at it. You're going to know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. And it says, Honey. Once again, honey. Picture of the word of God. Psalm 119, 103. You, it's uh, over and over how honey's a picture of the word of God. And over in Psalm 119, 103, it says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter 
than honey to my mouth. So, the word of God is instructive and it's nourishing. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. You get in the word and you work at it, you're going to know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. You'll have your senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And then it says, For before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. So we know this went from talking about the Lord Jesus Christ to talking most likely about Isaiah's son that he has in the very next chapter. May her Shalah Hashbaz is his name, the longest name in the Bible. It says, before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Basically, you know, before he gets to what we refer to as the age of accountability. It says, before he even gets to that age, the land that thou abhorrest, abhorrest shall be forsaken of both their kings. So before he even reaches the age of accountability, the land he abhors is going to be forsaken of both their kings. And it says, The Lord shall bring upon thee, and upon thy people, and upon thy father's house, days that have not come. From the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, remember, I told you, the southern kingdom broke away from the northern kingdom. Ephraim departed, or the northern kingdom broke away from the southern kingdom, back there with Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Ephraim being the ten northern tribes, kingdom of Israel. Judah being the southern kingdom, made up of Judah and Benjamin. And it says, Days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. So, worst day. this is worst days, the worst days since the dividing of the kingdom. That's what's to come. Even the king of Assyria, it says in verse 17. And the Assyria is the country which overthrows Ephraim. And it shall come to pass in that day. Watch out for the phrase, in that day, because that puts you in the context of the second coming. Puts you in the context of where it could be talking about the tribulation, the second coming, or the millennium. So as an in, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. So Egypt is known for those flies. Just like back there in Exodus chapter 8, the Lord brought those swarms of flies that came and bugged people to death, literally. And these, this is literal bees and flies. And then you got Assyria, known for bees and beekeeping. And you think about that, you think about within two years after Isaiah's prophecy, Syria falls to Assyria, and Pekah, remember king of Israel, no longer rules Israel. And he also falls to Assyria. So, and it says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the othermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Most likely literal fly, flies and bees, but could also picture their armies coming in like swarms as well, covering the whole land. And they shall come, it says, and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. So they'll just these flies, these bees will be everywhere. And then these armies, they'll be everywhere. They will be under the rocks. They'll rest in all the desolate valleys, in the holes, on all the thorns, and upon all bushes. That could be where you get the saying, shake a bush on the fallout. I mean, they'll just be everywhere. You, you know, like when something's everywhere, so the common saying is you can shake a bush and it'll fall out. And in the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor. 
shave with a razor that is hired, namely, by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. So the Lord's going to take Assyria, the king of Assyria, and use him as a razor, and he's going to shave the head, their head and their feet and, and their beard. And this really makes sense when you compare it with uh, Ezekiel chapter 5. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 5, and he tells Ezekiel, he tells him to do this strange thing. He says, And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard. Then take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. And it says, Thou shalt burn with the fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife, and a third part thou shalt scatter it in the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. Then take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For therefore, thereof shall a fire come forth into all the houses of Israel. So you can see there how he wants Ezekiel to shave his hair and then burn it with fire and do all these things to it. And it's a picture of what's going to happen to Israel. Because you go down in uh, verse 12, he says, A third part of thee shall die with pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee, and a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee, and I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. Just like he did, he had Ezekiel do with his hair. So he was using Ezekiel's hair as a picture of what was going to happen to the house of Israel. Just like here, he's, he's saying the king of Assyria is my razor. And it's going to come through and shave the head and the feet and the beard. And they're going to be scattered in the wind just like hair. Just like the picture there that Ezekiel did with his hair. So you see the picture there. And then it says in verse 21, Isaiah 7, 21, It shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. So you get, prophetically speaking, you think about in that day, in the tribulation, when, say, men are running from the Antichrist, they flee from the Antichrist, they're going to be might have... Just three animals. Trying to survive on three animals. And it says, And it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall that they shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall every one eat that is left in the land. So, surviving with three animals, having to eat that butter and honey because it's a time of poverty. Trying to survive on that, you see. And they are going to survive on that. And it shall come to pass in that day. Every place shall be where there were a thousand vines at a thousand silverlings. It shall be even for briars and thorns. So when there was a thousand vines at a thousand silverlings. And silverlings is like a, a silver coin of minute value. So there was like... A thousand vines at a thousand silverlings, meaning there was a bunch of them. It'll just be briars and thorns. Instead of vines, it's briars and thorns. Because that's, uh, remember, that's a picture of it being unkept by the Lord. Remember back there in Isaiah chapter 5, he talked about how, you know, Israel was the vineyard. but the And the Lord was the husbandman. But he was going to stop keeping his vineyard. And up was going to come briars and thorns. So instead of a thousand vines at a thousand silverlings, it should even be for briars and thorns. It's just going to be briars and thorns coming up. And it says, With arrows and with bows shall men come thither. Here come armies with their artillery. Because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all hills... They shall be digged with the mattock, the mattock like a pickaxe. There shall not come tither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. So the cattle eat and tread down the land, the lesser cattle like goats and sheep. 
So this land that was given to briars and thorns is now used for grazing. And that land that had a thousand vines as a, at a thousand silverlings, it shall even be for briars and thorns. So I, Ahaz, a wicked king, uh, he could have turned things around for himself. He could have asked for a sign. He could have been the king who he should have been. Got Judah off. Got Judah back on a good start himself. But the fate of Judah ends up just like the fate of the kingdom of Israel. Just like Ephraim. But that's Isaiah chapter 7.